Hi, today we're looking at OM cameras 150 to 400 mm lens and the 100 to 400 mm lens. One is much cheaper than the other. This is 1,100 pounds sterling and this is 6,500. I'll start off with two bits of good news. If you forked out the extra cash for the more expensive 150 to 400, you did get something for your money. And I don't just mean the built-in 1.25 extender and the extra stop of light, I mean optically. The pictures are slightly better than you get from this camera. But the second bit of good news is, if you bought the cheaper version, that difference is very slight and hard to see. But we'll come back to that and we'll talk about the optics at the end. I'm going to divide this into three parts. We're going to start off by looking at the physical attributes of the two lenses. Then I'll talk about the very important autofocus abilities. Are they the same? Is this one able to keep up with the more expensive lens when it comes to birds in flight? And then thirdly, we'll talk about the optical difference in the, in the quality of the pictures. Now when it comes to the physical size of these two lenses there's quite a considerable difference and it's interesting that most people when they swap over to Micro Four Thirds they do so because they want a lighter and more compact camera system. Well we're actually getting into quite a, a big heavy lens with the 150 to 400. That weighs in at 1875 grams. That's just the lens, not the camera body. And also when they're measuring these things or when they're weighing them, uh, they take the lens caps off, the, the, the foot and everything to make it as light as possible. The 100 to 400 weighs in at 985 grams. So that's quite a, a big difference. So just because this is the most expensive one, it isn't necessarily the one that's going to suit most people. Perhaps most people do want the lighter lens. In terms of the aperture, this is a constant f4.5 on the 100 to 50 to 400. Put the 1.25 extender in just by throwing this switch and it's a constant 5.6. And as this is a variable aperture, it varies from f5 to f6.3. A very nice feature of both of them is the minimum focus distance. They both focus down to 1.3 meters. And I think that's incredible. It wasn't that long ago when I was using my Canon equipment and I had a, over the years a 500, a 600, an 800 mil Canon lens. The minimum focus was so far away that I often had to fit an extension tube, not an extender, but a hollow extension tube that we associate with macro photography in order to be able to focus on small birds and get them a reasonable size in the image. Now with these lenses, the equivalent of an 800 mil with its two times crop factor, you can photograph butterflies and dragonflies at uh, the minimum focus. So that's, that's made a, a huge impact on, on my photography. Image stabilization, that's a little bit more complicated. With the 150 to 400 mil lens, the image stabilizer in the lens synchronizes with the image stabilizer in the body and they work together. So this is an OM1 camera body on here. It gives you a combination of eight stops of image stabilizer. That's because it's a, a pro lens. With this lens, not quite so good. We've got three stops of image stabilizer in the lens. We've also got the image stabilizer in the body, but they don't synchronize. So you don't get as many stops of image stabilizer. I'm not really the person to make a judgment on this because I take very few pictures that aren't on a tripod and when I am taking pictures handheld it's because I'm doing birds in flight and I tend to be panning quite rapidly. So really image stabiliser is not something I tend to notice that much but it isn't quite as good on this lens but three stops in the lens is still a lot for me. It wasn't that long ago we had one stop of image stabiliser and that was very impressive so three stops sounds pretty good to me. Eight stops just out of this world. Both lenses you can use with extenders the 1.4 and the two times extender. I'm not having a lot of success with the two times on either lens. Neither of them look very sharp when I put the two times on, so I'm tending to avoid the two times. Especially on this lens when I've already got a built-in 1.25 extender, I'm getting such a lot of magnification anyway, that takes it up to 1000mm. And I do use it with the 1.4. Well, I've used both of them with the 1.4 and been happy with them. Two times, not quite so much. That takes us on to the build quality, I think. 
I can tell a difference. This lens is definitely more solid. This has far more of a plasticky feel to it, but it's it's far from rubbish. It still zooms very nicely and the and the focus ring is very smooth. But just little things like the lens hood on here. It's a very substantial lens hood with a very large knob on there. It's easily to easy to grip. So when I put that on, I feel very confident that lens hood is not going to fall off when I'm walking about with the lens on a tripod over my shoulder which you tend to see bird photographers doing it's a very firm feel to it this is more the the plasticky type with a plastic thread in there I don't tend to wear it out because I very rarely take the lens hoods off I've got camera bags that are big enough to take the lens and the body and the lens hood in so I don't have to assemble it every time I take it out of the bag now both lenses have the Arca Swiss mount built into the lens foot which is a fantastic idea why it took camera manufacturers so many years to come up with that idea I don't know unfortunately I use Manfrotto mounts so I still have to have a mount on there but nevertheless it's a great idea to have the most popular lens mount built into it just have a quick look at some of the switches on the side we have a lock switch on this side which is just to lock the zoom so it won't when you're walking about it won't droop like that and come down but I'm not finding it's ever done that so I have never used that lock switch yet maybe over the years it becomes loose and starts to do that as you're walking with it hanging on a strap but so far it hasn't so for me that's a, a bit of over engineering that I don't need it's a shame the lens tends to telephoto out when you're zooming especially when you're working in a high that's quite a, a major problem you suddenly come back and the scrimming drops down in front of your lens this lens doesn't do that when you zoom it's internal then the switches on the other side there's the focus limiter switch where you can tell it not to focus beyond a certain distance it's redundant I'm never likely to use that because first of all I've got focus limiter built into the camera now where I can specify the distances I want to restrict it to but I never use that anymore and that's really because the bird detection autofocus is now so good I just do not feel a need for it I just do not have the problem of the focus jumping off the bird underneath there we have an autofocus manual focus switch and then the image stabilizer on or off but that's only turning off the image stabilizer in the lens not in the body very similar on the 100 to 50 to 400 um, apart from we've, we can also program some of the the buttons that are underneath this neoprene cover so again i don't i don't use that feature because i can't see the buttons but also there's enough buttons on the camera which i've customized to do what i want them to do i don't feel a need for another one on the lens and if you are using those features there is a another switch here where you can turn the sound the bleep off that occurs when you press those buttons but it's just something i've not used and finally I'll just mention the, the swivel that's built into the lens where you can go from horizontal to vertical it is much better on the 100 to 50 to 400 than it is on that one it's a lovely smooth feel to it and it clicks when you're in place so you can probably hear this I'm in the horizontal mode when I've turned it 90 degrees it makes a little clicking noise and you can feel it drop into the groove and I really like that they used to be on all my Canon lenses and now it's on this one it's a nice feature hopefully you stop at 90 degrees you've still got a level horizon also I don't have to tighten it up so here I, I can lock it so I can't turn it and then I can unlock it but I don't have to keep locking it when I'm turning from one to the other the lens is still stable in the mount whereas this one I undo it and I swivel and then there's a, there's a little bit of a rocking movement there so I feel the need to tighten it up again this mount will come off completely in fact sometimes it does if you do leave it loose sometimes the mount just slips off and it's a bit fiddly to to put it back on again so that's the the physical attributes of the two lenses let's move on now to talking about the very important autofocus because if that lens doesn't autofocus on birds in flight as well as that one I wouldn't consider it now I've been using the 150 to 400 mil for some time now I'm very familiar with what it's capable of but I've had this one long enough to have a very strong opinion about it 
I've talked before on YouTube about how difficult it is to find birds in flight where you can go and test it. You don't want swans or geese that are too slow flying. Don't particularly want swallows or swifts because they're too fast flying, although it is capable of keeping up with them. But I have this churchyard that I go to that's full of wood pigeons and they fly around a lot. So even though we're in the month of August, the wood pigeons are still breeding, I tend to think of August as the peak of the season for wood pigeons. So there's still a lot of flight activity going on there. So I've had two sessions with this lens in that churchyard and I'm happy to say I cannot tell any difference in the autofocus abilities between the two lenses. It's coping very, very well. Obviously you're stopped down in terms of the, the aperture, but the autofocus works very well. The one area where it didn't perform very well was when I started to test it by focusing very close on a grey stone and then putting the lens onto a tree at, at a distance and pressing the autofocus to see how long it took to get there to see if I could see a difference. Now that's a very subjective decision. Uh, but again, I couldn't really see a difference. But what was noticeable is sometimes when I focused on a grey stone, that's just grey stone, no marks in it whatsoever, the autofocus would hesitate on this lens. Because it's got to stop less light, it would hesitate and then struggle to get started to focus on it. If you had a contrasty subject or a bit of bright grass or, or a bush or something, with lots of contrast in the leaves, it was okay. It was just when it was a dark grey stone. This lens is far less inclined to do that and I put that down to that extra stop of light that you get with it. And finally, we'll move on to the optical quality of the two lenses, but we'll do that in front of the computer. I've taken some test pictures with live birds, but I do like to use my little model woodpecker, which has got lovely fine feathers in it, and it means I've got one I know isn't going to move. Now, I've said this before about YouTube not being the best place for judging quality of lenses. It's just not a good media for it. If I watch other people's YouTube channels when they're showing illustrations of different lenses and comparing them, I can't really see the difference. And I find myself just hitting the fast forward button to see what their conclusions are rather than trying to see the difference on YouTube where the video is quite compressed. So what I have done is I've loaded a gallery up of pictures on a web page and I'll put a link to that web page in the description underneath the video and you can go and look at some larger JPEG files and I've tried to take similar pictures with both lenses and if you blow the picture up to the larger size you can see which lens it is off to the right hand side. For this picture I did turn the bird detection off and I just focused on the centre of the bird here. Now this picture is taken with the 150 to 400 mil and this one with the 100 to 400 mil and the difference to me is fairly obvious i can see the 150 to 400 is the sharper lens but i'm looking on a large monitor looking on youtube i suspect you're going to struggle to see that difference if i look at the two pictures side by side it's even easier to see the difference I'm not a great one for pixel peeping. If you've got to zoom in to 100 or 200% before you can see the difference, then there is no significant difference to me. Now, I would expect everybody to be able to see the difference if you looked at those pictures on that web page. You've got two subjects very similar, one taken with one lens, one taken with the other. You go backwards or forwards, you can see the difference. But I think this is a more interesting test. In this folder, I've got 292 pictures. About half of them are taken with the 100 to 400 and the other half with the 150 to 400 mil. Now I've batch renamed them, so I've only got a glance at the file name and it will tell me what lens was used. But then I've shuffled them up. They are now in a totally random order. So now if I bring these pictures up full size and start to go through them, can I guess which lens was used? Now this is a far more real world test to me, this is far more valid. Now I don't think you can see the difference on YouTube because of the compression, so I'm not going to go through them all with you. I'm just going to tell you that when I went through them, I got it right about 75% of the time. Which really brings me back to what I said at the beginning. There is a difference between these two lenses optically, but it's not a huge difference. Thanks for watching.